Good evening, dear colleagues from all over the world. It's great to be here. Thanks for yeah your time. And um, yeah, I hope most of you are already online. I don't have uh, any feedback now. But uh, yeah, again, welcome to this uh, webinar about uh, biological bone augmentation, working with the patient's own bone, with a real bone, as I like to say, and uh, yeah, 10, 10 mistakes to, um, to avoid. So this will be the training program of today. We will go first over the principles of bone harvesting and the split bone clock technique by my former mentor, Professor Fuad Khoury, then 10 mistakes to avoid when harvesting and fixing the plates. And finally, I also want to show a new approach for safe and fast bone harvesting with you. And in the end, I have a little present for you. So I don't want to bore you with my CV, just a few words. I'm from Heidelberg, it's in the south of Germany. I was then research associate in the maxillofacial department of the University Clinic of Heidelberg. And the time that influenced me most was my time as oral surgeon and later also senior physician at Professor Fuad Khoury. And uh, most of you might also know him. And since uh, more than 10 years, I'm having now my own clinic and giving lectures. Some of you might already be familiar with my Facebook group, Real Bone Builders. We have meanwhile more than 16,000 colleagues joining and um, yeah, also sharing their cases. Also feel invited to share your cases with autogenous bone. And uh, yeah, some of you might be more familiar with their Instagram. So you can also follow me there. Um, just look for Dr. Frank Sestro. And uh, yeah, I'm also a little bit... Um, yeah, proud that uh, meanwhile we are reaching more than half a million of accounts per month. And uh, of course, I'm also very, very glad that uh, yeah, COVID is over. Uh, it's possible to, to travel again and to also to meet a lot of colleagues again in person. And in the end, I also will give some small information about our course education. So this is uh, my clinic in the south of uh, Germany. I said it already. We are covering actually the whole spectrum of um, yeah, general dentistry, not only surgery. We have a big team of uh, more than 25 people. Also um, yeah, our own laboratory, the master technicians, milling machines, so complete digital workflow. And uh, yeah, I'm very grateful to have such a wonderful team behind me. Otherwise, it wouldn't be possible also to travel now, giving lectures, writing books and all the other things I'm doing now. And for those of you who haven't seen my home city, Heidelberg, uh, just a quick teaser. And uh, maybe I can uh, welcome you one day to one of our courts because they are held in my home city, Heidelberg. Uh, you see here the old uh, bridge from the 17th century and uh, also the old castle from the 13th century and of course the wonderful old town by the way with the longest pedestrian zone in Europe. So, um, old castle, old bridge, old town, everything old is old good or is old bad? Maybe a little bit a uh, strange question, but at least when we are going to conference, we see only in the program new innovative material, new technique. But uh, yeah, is this really better? So I don't want to disappoint you now from the first beginning, but what I will share with you today is actually quite old techniques, more than 25 years. But in my opinion, this is even more powerful because we know the long-term results, and I will also share them with you later, um, than any new materials. So um, let's start with the 10 failures to avoid. So these failures can be done in diagnosis, in osteotomies, and uh, also with, when we are fixating the blocks. And uh, yeah, one mistake I want to start with, uh, you might wonder why I'm saying that, but uh, in many cases, uh, people are, when they're going for a tortuous bone, they go uh, right away for a second donor site, but in many cases, this is not needed. So instead you can just go for for example, in this case, a trefine, just try to think autogenous, as my good friend uh, Ua Merit from Istanbul always likes to say, uh, just think, where can I collect bone? And uh, if you have this mindset, you will find a lot of that and can, of course, save a lot of money uh, instead of um, yeah, spending it for substitutes, which are only osteoconductive. You see here, we can fix these uh, bone cores just with the head of the screw. Or also, this is another case where we build some bone vertically and uh, yeah, then um, you see here some 
bone needed to be re-augmented in um, the palatal area. But instead of going for another block and uh, open again the external oblique line, we can just easily go, for example, to the tuberosity, get some bone from there and use it. Uh, recently in the social media, I, I saw a nice expression. It was called the Robin Hood technique. So taking from the rich side and give it to the poor side. So this is something always keep in the head and you can even reuse the screws as you see it here. And we have now the, the, the implant surrounded with a lot of torchness bone. So try to think autogenous and sometimes a second donor site is really not needed to keep it uh, minimal invasive. Another mistake to avoid, think about or be aware about the danger zone. Because if we are going to the external oblique line, to the retromolar area where we are usually harvesting the bone, that's a wonderful area where we can collect a lot of bone. <clears throat> you see it here, you see really the nice balcony, I can say. And uh, this makes, of course, the harvesting part much easier. So when you're going more to the ramus, you have to be aware that here the nerve is more superficial. Many people are talking about ramus graft, but indeed, um, yeah, so the ramus is not the area um, where we are collecting our bone, but the retromolar area. So be aware that you're not going, especially as a beginner, not too far into the ramus. So that's why I showed it here in red. Now you see this circle on the side and uh, yeah, we are calling this the danger zone. And this is the only area where we are close to the ramus where theoretically we could come close to the nerve. In this area, I would rather uh, recommend you when you are doing your incisions, not sink it deeper than 1.5 to 2 millimeter. Doesn't matter if you're working with a disc, the micro saw or peer to surgery, no need to sink it deeper than 1.5 to 2 millimeter to create so-called predetermined breaking lines. And this is enough to take out the block. So we are coming to the next mistake to avoid, which is uh, using wrong angles when you are doing the osteotomies for the block. What do I mean with that? You see here the harvesting after doing the um, osteotomies in the correct position. And then the hammering part to get out the block is actually uh, very, very short. So how do we get to these results? So the first um, osteotomy is done in a right angle to the occlusal plane. This helps you to find the right angle in the mouth. So because to find distances and angles in the mouth is always very complicated. So when you understand this is the occlusal plane and your first incision should be in a right angle or perpendicular to that, this will make your life easier. So this is the first cut. Again, stay away from the rings, especially when you're starting. Then the next, next osteotomy is done parallel to the first one. Um, but you see, we are starting at this balcony. Not We are not starting in the area of the tooth, but at this balcony, because we want to take advantage from this nice convex structure. And this is an incision which is wrong. So because sometimes I see colleagues also doing the horizontal incision, then parallel to the occlusal plane. And then we are ending up with a too small block. It's like a triangular shape. And this is something you should definitely avoid. Instead, you should do your horizontal incision um, parallel to what? To the external oblique line. Exactly. So in the end, we are ending up with like a trapezoid. You see it here. And um, yeah, then you can do either perforations crestally or also incision when you're working with PCO surgery. Both is fine. But the advantage when you are working with perforations is by doing that, we are creating a tension. And in the moment when we are using then hammer and chisel, this tension relieves and the block is almost jumping out. So a little tip, my recommendations. Afterwards, we are splitting the block then, and I think you have seen that already a lot in the social media or somewhere else. Afterwards, you're splitting the block and you're scraping also this block that these uh, plates are becoming thinner. And the same time, you're also collecting then the bone chips. Because what is the idea of this split bone block technique uh, of Professor Ford Curry? The idea is that with full cortical blocks, the revascularization takes too long time. While when we are particulating a part of that, we are enlarging the surface. When we are enlarging the surface of the bone, we have uh, more access and faster access from the blood vessels. That means we can keep that bone alive. So that uh, makes a big difference when we do the re-entry 
it's completely a different picture than what we are seeing when we are doing a full cortical block. It's vascularized, it's red bone, and this is exactly what we need. So you need not only the plates, you need also, uh, yeah, these are uh, huge amount of bone chips. And usually you can gain that from uh, scraping the plates, for example, with a safe scraper. And I think, yeah, most of you are in love with this instrument, me too, but you will be even more in love when you're using it extra early, because intra early, you will always see the patient's uh, head and their jaw is moving. While extra early, it's all rigid, you can hold it with your own jaw, and then you can scrape it. Then the amount of chips you will collect here is much bigger than collected from intra early. You see here, after only three to four months, the nice, yeah, vascularized bone. That's another advantage with our method. So uh, I was also, I'm coming from a GBR school, as probably all of you. So, but um, yeah, the results are completely different. So usually we are uh, re-entering that area and we have this bone powder. It's not integrated, it's white, it's not vascularized at all. What we are seeing when we are working with autogenous bone is completely different. We are really having real bone afterwards, vascularized bone, as you can see it here. And uh, of course, we also have a uh, much more stable results. And this uh, may be the most important take home message of this whole webinar. This bone will stay stable. I know the companies who are selling the substitutes, they will tell you something else. They will tell you you have to mix it with substitutes. You have to cover it with substitutes, but that's not the truth. And the most interesting thing is, I mean, we all learned that when we were students. Bone is the only tissue in the body which comes to its original state after healing. So it's not like soft tissue where we have scar tissue afterwards. No, bone really becomes the same bone as before. And of course we have to give function loading in that area, but then this bone will stay stable and I will also share some studies with you, even with vertical bone augmentation. And also the quality of bone chips, you see it here on the right picture, is completely different than we are used to have it when we are working with substitutes. What is the next mistake? Crossing lines. What do I mean with that? This is very important. So you see, when we are doing our osteotomies, it's very important that these lines are crossing, that these lines are overlapping. It doesn't have to be more than one or two millimeter, but this is important to ensure that the block is coming out afterwards. So you see here, um, distally, it should be uh, overlapping. Mesially, it should be overlapping. And uh, yeah, you see it also here on the right uh, side uh, through the mirror. And uh, you have to ensure that if the block is not coming out well, this might be uh, one of the mistakes you have done that your lines are not overlapping. Also, when you use creative surgery, it's important that, um, yeah, this is the case. So one study I want to share with you from 2015, we have here a 10 year prospective clinical study with almost 4000 crafted sites. And um, yeah. The most important take home message from that, you can of course also look it up in um, yeah, PubMed. No, not one major nerve lesion with permanent anesthesia was observed. So I know, uh, yeah, most of us are somehow scared, kind of brainwashed also maybe from the companies. You should always use our, yeah, our substitutes from the can because you can injure the nerve. But the paradox thing is somehow, I mean, I'm sure all of you, most of you are removing impacted deeply impacted wisdom teeth on a regular base maybe on a may on a, on a daily base or weekly base and what are we doing when we are removing a wisdom tooth we are taking the biggest burr we are destroying the whole buckle bone wall are we scared then no but when it comes to harvesting a block or taking out a, even and you should start with a baby block then so, somehow we are scared and um, yeah my let's call it mission is really to encourage you that you can do that. You can do a small block. You can uh, yeah, um, grow your comfort zone. And uh, yeah, I can also tell you one thing. There is usually no no way uh, back. When you once start with a torches bone, you see the beautiful results. And uh, you're saving yeah, thousands and thousands of uh, dollars. And same time giving your patient uh, yeah, the best outcome. Usually there is no way of uh, going back to this method. Good, you see here uh, another mistake that should be avoided, which is a too thick block. So what do I mean with that? So in our mind, is, uh, when we are going for a block, we should uh, have a block with a lot of sponges part or a lot of cranchulous part attached. But this is not the case. We are aiming actually only for the cortical bone. That means we should also uh, do all, which is uh, in, in our, um, yeah, 
possibilities to create the uh, the breaking line exactly between the cortical part and the sponges part. This makes uh, the procedure less invasive, less hammering, and of course also faster. So, and also the angle should be right. So uh, what you see here is actually then the wrong angle. And um, also um, you, you went too far to the lingual side and it ends up that we are harvesting a too big block actually, which means also more hammering and so on. And uh, we want to do this uh, actually as uh, minimal invasive as possible. And uh, overall, I mean, the idea is always the same. We are making four cuts or three cuts and the perforations, which should overlap. So uh, sorry for always uh, repeating myself, but this is uh, how we are learning. I learned this technique uh, while I was four years at Professor Curry um, by uh, repetition. So I've seen hundreds and hundreds of cases and seen the lectures. And every time uh, you're catching another detail and the devil is always in the detail, as you know. But the overall idea is we cut maybe 10% of these lines and the other 90% are broken out. And of course, we want to uh, reduce the invasiveness of that. And uh, here an example, you see a CBCT. We have the cortical bone, we have the cancellous bone. And the idea is to cause uh, our fracture exactly between them. Usually some sponges bone might be attached, but um, yeah, we don't need to work with that. We use only cortical bone also for the chips, no need for sponges bone. And this is what we also should avoid um, the, the wrong um, angle when we are placing our perforations, because then we can also uh, bring a little bit more risk uh, that we come close to the nerve. And uh, this is, of course, what we should avoid. So we are coming now to mistake number six, no splitting. Somehow I mentioned already before, because uh, some colleagues are absolutely fine with harvesting a block, have done this already several times. But then when it comes to splitting the block, Somehow people think, oh, this is not so necessary, or they want to reduce the chair time or any other reasons. Um, or maybe they are also scared from the splitting because uh, you have to start first with a smaller disc and then you're changing to a larger disc. So, but I also want to take uh, your, your, your anxiety away from that because first of all, I mean, when we were students, we, we did a lot of um, yeah, uh, laboratory work, right? I mean, we were used to work with the crowns and also work with a bigger disc, so this shouldn't be a problem. And the second, um, the problem is uh, coming at the patient. So because when we, we, when we only adapt this uh, thick cortical bone, we might have uh, some uh, integration, as you see here also in the, in the apical area, but the bone is completely white. Why? Because the vascularization of the blood vessels in this into this block just takes too long time. And this ends up that these bone cells are dying. And uh, when they are dying and we have white bone, that means dead bone, what happens next? Macrophages are activated uh, and uh, osteoclasts. And uh, we are having the problem of resorption. Sooner or later, we will have here some resorption process. And this is still in the mind, especially of older colleagues. They are not uh, believing in a tortuous bone because they had such results. And this is, of course, what we don't want to have. And this is the reason also why the split bone block technique, the curry technique, is so successful. We overcome that problem by using cortical bone, which is super stable. On the other side, we are giving this regeneration potential by particulating it. Again, by working with these chips, we are enlarging the surface. We have faster access from the blood vessels and, uh, yeah, better um, vascularization and uh, wonderful results, real red bone and um, good long lasting results. What else is a big mistake? Of course, there are hundreds of mistakes. And in the end, I will also give you uh, the opportunity if you're interested um, to join also one of our courses. But now I, yeah, I try to find uh, 10 mistakes, which are kind of often. And uh, one is, of course, also leaving sharp edges. These sharp edges should be removed before fixing the plates. I would also not recommend you to fix the plates first and then round off the sharp edges, but uh, remove all sharp edges extra early. Then you can feel it digitally with your finger if everything is uh, removed and then fix your plates that you don't have to manipulate so much anymore intra because any manipulation of the plates intra orally can uh, yeah, um, uh, uh, make the risk higher that um, the, the plates become loose. And uh, of course, um, this is also one of the things you should definitely avoid. 
So let's assume you, um, you did everything right, but still you had an exposure. The good thing is working with a torch and stone, you have hardly any exposure because the adaption of the periosteum on the bone is really, really dense and very safe. But let's assume maybe because in this case, for example, it was a patient with diabetes, um, you are having a perforation. What is the worst thing you should definitely not do? Exactly, suturing. You should not try to resuture it because by doing that, you're cutting the last blood supply in this area. Let's assume you're doing now a mattress suture over that. You're cutting the last blood supply and uh, you are ending up with even bigger perforation. But this doesn't mean that you can't do anything. You can remove, uh, you should remove then the sharp edges. You should uh, take an impression, uh, give this to your laboratory. They should create a transparent, flexible splint with one millimeter distance from the exposed bone. You can, uh, yeah, and the patient should charge it then um, three times per day with an anti-inflammatory gel. For example, sulcusaril, or it can also uh, be done with a uh, chlorhexidine gel. What other mistakes do we have? One other uh, mistake you should avoid is uh, wrong plate positioning. Because, uh, I mean, this is now uh, uh, an example with a vertical case. And uh, you see, we can go into the height with a parallel technique or the right angle technique. You can never go into the height only with one plate. And uh, first thing is you should never place your plate um, lingually, too far lingually, because here the soft tissue becomes weaker and you have a higher risk of exposure. And also what is very important, because um, when you have this nice support for the soft tissue, you should watch out that your plate, and uh, now look very carefully to the plate on the occlusal uh, part. So um, if this plate is changing the angle slightly, I hope that, like it uh, changed, then you're also creating an edge on one side, and then it can open up on that side. So make sure... Uh, that's the take-home message that your occlusal plate, if you are placing uh, yeah, two plates to go into the height, that your occlusal plate is placed parallel to the occlusal plate. Watch out that your plate is not placed like that or like that. And uh, yeah, then you will also have a much less risk of exposure. And you see here one case. It was a case, a right angle technique with a tunnel technique. You might also have seen that. You see the plate is nicely rounded, all sharp uh, edges are um, rounded off. And uh, this is one of our eight techniques. We are also uh, teaching then in our courses and um, fix them um, with uh, yeah, uh, the, the TMS screw system. And you see here the result in the end, which uh, looks quite nice. But there are two mistakes. One mistake was um, that I placed um, this uh, plate slightly, exactly what I told, told you, uh, slightly tilt towards the lingual side. So here it was standing up a little bit. And this ended up also um, yeah, in exposure, opening and inflammation. So because uh, I'm someone who is not only sharing, let's say, the, the, the wonderful cases, but uh, also if uh, problems occur and uh, yeah, also some big ego was uh, one of the mistakes coming into place because this was also one of my first cases. And uh, what I always say also to our students, you should not start with vertical unless you have done 20 to 30 lateral board augmentation. So uh, it's all like a learning curve. You should not start with some things which are a little bit more complicated because with tunnel technique, you have less good overview. Not start with these uh, things um, too early. So take your time, leave your ego at home. And uh, yeah, give the best uh, and the uh, most um, predictable outcome to your patients. So a 3D vertical crest augmentation of posterior mandible um, using tunnel techniques. That means also another 10-year clinical study from 2022, actually um, quite new. And uh, what was impressive here, we are talking about vertical bone augmentation. So the supreme discipline when we are talking about uh, yeah, bone augmentation. And we have less than one millimeter vertical bone resorption after doing this with purely autogenous bone. And on average, um, you don't see my cursor now, but on average, we were able, uh, you see the, the line above, we, on average, we were able to, um, to gain um, almost eight millimeter height. And uh, we know that this is also not in a predictable way possible with bone substitutes. The absolute minute um, um, maximum, and this is also not predict predictable in my way, is four millimeter. So uh, when you want to do vertical bone augmentation, there is no way around autogenous bone because this is the only yeah, gold standard also because only autogenous bone is osteoinductive, osteogenetic, of course also osteoconductive, but substitutes 
only work as a scaffold or a framework. They are only osteoconductive and you have to have luck so that the patient has a good regeneration potential. Otherwise, it's not working. So the nice cases you usually see on the, um, yeah, also on the big stages are cases um, done at patients with good regeneration potential. And of course, afterwards, we always know that if it works or if it doesn't. But when we're working with a torsionous bone, we don't want to take that risk. That's why we, even without knowing if the patient has a good or a bad regeneration potential, we always go on the yeah, safe way, which is uh, working with osteoinductive material. So what um, yeah, other mistake is important? We are coming to plate stability. And this is one of the most important things you have to keep in mind. And uh, let's see here one case uh, where we did parallel technique before you have seen right angle technique. Yeah, now you see parallel technique in the frontal area. First, you will see the harvesting part. And you see, we can really go up to big um, yeah, blocks up to five centimeter. This is possible even when the external oblique line doesn't look so well. And uh, yeah, we have uh, usually a surplus of bone. So when you're trained in this method, usually uh, you are not having not enough bone, but you have a surplus, you have too much bone. And um, yeah, sometimes you also have to throw some bone away. Um, you see here uh, the plates on the palatal side, fixed with the screws and also on the, um, on the buckle side. And as you see, because we don't have so bone, uh, so much bone here for stability reason, so we have to use enough screws for giving good primary stability to, the, to these plates. If you see that the plate is still moving like a little bit, that means you have to, um, yeah, to use here another screw, and uh, yeah, to bring one hundred percent stability into um, these cases. And uh, yeah, another mistake also, um, you see here, this was a referred case. The patient uh, uh, was, uh, yeah, got the implant placement then by the referring doctor. And this is, of course, also what you should not do. You see here placing four really big diameter implants. I mean, we have perfect bone afterwards, but you should not place two big diameter implants and also too close to each other. So uh, this is something, because even the most beautiful bone augmentation, you can destroy it afterwards when um, you're yeah, doing mistakes with your uh, implants. So rather go for smaller diameter um, and also maybe less implants. So two, two implants in this case are usually also enough if you don't want to have problems. So I think we can state that split bone block technique, SBBT by Professor Curry is a very reliable technique, but what are the main challenges with conventional bone block harvesting? And as I mentioned already before, um, the more invasive part comes into play because uh, overall we have to do four incisions or osteotomies and uh, overall 10% are cut and the other 90% are broken out. So that means harvesting takes time. With piezo surgery, it can even take longer than 20 minutes. So you need to hammer. You have to, um, you have usually more or less bleeding from the marrow. We have a cortical sponges block in the end. Um, of course, we need also to split it. This is uh, crucial. We have to work with very thin plates because also the revascularization takes faster here. And uh, of course, we also have to split it and uh, thin it out. So if you, if you have a straight edge plate, remember the right angle technique, which I showed you, because here in these areas on the sides, we have a, yeah, also kind of danger zone. If you don't smooth it out and don't round it off, in the end, uh, you might induce here um, some exposure, what we, of course, don't want to have. And of course, um, yeah, it's a little bit uh, invasive and you need to uh, require, or it requires advanced skills. But still, until today, and uh, we are knowing this technique uh, since uh, 60 years of block harvesting, split bone block technique has uh, 25 years now. This is the only way how we can um, yeah, approach bigger defects and get very reliable results in uh, almost 100% of these cases. But uh, now I want to share also my thoughts uh, in which case I'm sometimes struggling. Um, yeah, in these cases where I'm struggling, if I should really go for a block. I, in the past, was always going for a block because uh, the last uh, 12 years, I was not doing any or not one GBR anymore in my clinic. So we are not using substitutes when it comes to bone augmentation at the crest not one. So I'm very strict in that. And um, yeah, I know that this is the best result for your patients, but still I feel in so those cases when just a little bit of bone is missing, uh, I feel that this might be a little bit uh, over augmentation or over yeah, um, treatment. 
So of course, some of you might say now, why not place this implant now just a little bit deeper? I agree with you. We can place this implant just a little bit deeper. But when we look at the implant in the mesial area, I think we agree that there somehow this just place it a little bit deeper comes to a limit. And uh, I guess most of you probably would uh, now open again a bottle and their uh, membrane and spend $500 for that. Um, but is there also another alternative in such cases to work with purely autogenous bone and get wonderful results? Let's see what we are finding here. And uh, yeah, my question was, I mean, we have the field of biological bone augmentation working with real bone. We have on the one side, the split bone block technique, SBBT by Professor Curry. But what less invasive techniques do we have? So this was my question. And of course, I know many of you might think now about uh, why not working with the uh, GBR. But um, yeah, the precondition, in my opinion, is to uh, get reliable results. And in my opinion, bone substitutes do not give these reliable results. So let's see if I was uh, yeah, finding a solution. Because my question is now, what if there would be such an easy method that we can, yeah, uh, work with plates or co collect plates within seconds without the need of hammering or bleeding from marrow. And at least when I'm replacing now the word plates by the word uh, cylinders, I think we all know what I'm talking about. I'm talking about uh, working with uh, trefines. And uh, I think uh, most of you have uh, worked already with trefines. You see here, um, we have uh, the possibility to harvest uh, small cylinders. And these cylinders are um, yeah, can actually be collected then with these uh, yeah, uh, trefines and be placed, for example, with the, with the head of the screw. So we are clamping effect. And uh, yeah, the only possibility or the only problem, let's say, is uh, that usually these cylinders are uh, very small. So we can only use them for inside the conduit defects or for small dehiscence sense defects. And the other disadvantage is uh, when we are placing them slightly outside the contour because of the shape of the cylinders, we are usually facing here uh, more remodeling or more resorption. So it's not comparable uh, also in the outcome result with our plates or our shells. But still for small defects, this is a, a way to go. And my thought process, and I want to take you also on my pro, uh, thought process, is this. So I was thinking that maybe we can use this, um, yeah, the trefines also to collect bone shells. So the question I asked myself was how to collect bone shells, not um, cylinders, with a trefine. So because then, I mean, we would uh, solve a lot of problems, right? We would be much faster. But you also know what is the challenge when we are working with the trefines? Exactly, it's overheating. So when we are working with a small trefine, we can have already overheating problem. When we are going with a bigger trefine, then we have much more. So uh, yeah, risk of uh, overheating. So um, when I had this idea of uh, working uh, with a trefine to collect bone shells, I was first ordering all trefines, which I found on the German market. And now comes the idea which I had, and I want to share it with you. Instead of placing this big trefine, we are really talking about like a more than one centimeter uh, big trefine. Instead of placing it in the middle of the crest, I placed it in the periphery with the idea that we really only collect the shell, even without the need of splitting it anymore. And you see, it sank now just two millimeter into the bone that we don't have to split it anymore afterwards, because then we also have a less um, chair time at the patient and you know time is money so um this turns out in yeah my first trials um so many many years ago i can also yeah invite you to try it but i have also to warn you because uh, it might be a little bit challenging first of all um, what you need is a very disciplined uh, assistance because uh, as you see or as you can imagine we really need a very good assistance uh, to hold um, yeah uh, to retract the soft tissue and as you see also in this case even then um, some soft tissue can go into this uh, trefine but this is not even the biggest problem the other problem is that we don't have any control over the width of this trefine so how do we know that we really stay uh, only two millimeter inside the bone and not going deeper? And as you know, in the retromolar area, there's also then the nerve. And when we are cho choosing um, the wrong angle, we might uh, have a risk for injuring the nerve. 
And finally, of course, you also have the challenge of uh, yeah overheating. So, but I think still we can agree and uh, yeah uh, summarize that uh, by working with the trefan in this way, we are fast because ninety percent of the error of this uh, yeah bone block we are we are collecting now is actually cut, and only the last ten percent have to be broken out. So this is, I think, an advantage. But as I said. So these are the, 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 the upsides, but now we have also the down, downside. That means how to protect the soft tissue. We have to have a solution for that. And also how to protect the nerve that we are not going deeper into the bone. And the final challenge I mentioned already before, how to overcome this overheating problem with this big trephine. And uh, let's see if I also found a solution for that. And here comes already Actually, the solution, which sounds uh, kind of uh, simple, but obviously I was the first who had this solution. So meanwhile, I have also um, yeah patents in more than 70 countries. So in China, in USA, in uh, Europe, and uh, actually everywhere. And uh, yeah, it was a simple idea, but I can tell you also one thing to bring it to life was actually very challenging. What I was doing was combining a trephine with a protector. So you see first uh, yeah, drawings here in 2015. So I'm working on that actually almost nine years. And you see here the first uh, yeah, also printings for this protector. And uh, yeah, I'm also a little bit proud to announce that uh, within the next uh, two months, we are ready actually to bring also th this new technology to the market. We are calling it the Semilunar Technique. And you see here the trephine with this protector um, and uh, yeah, so the idea is that only 10% of the trephine are in the bone and 90% of the of the trephine are outside the bone. But this is not a problem because uh, we have now a protection via the protector from soft tissue injury. And now comes actually, um, yeah, I think a very smart idea because this protector is not only for um, yeah, protecting from soft tissue injury. It also protects from nerve injury. Why? Because it's like a stop. It uh, prevents from going uh, from uh, that the trephine is going deeper into the bone. It's like a stop. It can't go deeper than this two millimeter into the bone. And this is actually on one side uh, the protection from soft tissue injury. On the other side, protection from nerve injury. And we have really only this only these two millimeter thick shells. And this is also the reason why we are having this kind of logo, the trephine and the protector. Good, let's see now in real time. So this is also a study with the university clinic. Uh, you see now in real time, the use of this uh, instrument, the trephine with the protector. And you will also understand why we're calling it the semilunar technique. First of all, because I thought it uh, sounds cooler than half moon technique, but uh, yeah. So you will understand um, also the reason for that. What we are collecting is now actually the intracortical shell. And you see this roundness. It lo really looks like a half moon. And uh, it's an intracortical shell. That means uh, the sponges bone is usually not open unless the cortical bone is really thin. But usually uh, the cortical bone is uh, thicker than uh, two millimeter. So we can really take several shells out from this cortical bone as simple as um, yeah, peeling an apple. So we can say we uh, solved these problems. We are able now to protect the soft tissue with a protector. We are able to protect the nerve also with the protector. And also because I didn't uh, show you now in detail, but uh, we also included in this trap find an internal irrigation. And only by doing that, we were overcoming this overheating problem. And in the end, there's also a ceram ceramic bearing. So for stability reason, we have like a mandrel inside with this internal irrigation, and this ends up in a, a ceramic bearing. And uh, with all these components, we are guaranteeing actually that uh, we don't have this overheating problem. Of course, what you need is then contra-angled handpiece with uh, internal irrigation. You see here one small case, uh, semi-lunar technique, um, then uh, you see... Yeah, actually, uh, our uh, slogan, just peel it. Uh, by the way, I trademarked it and I got also a letter from Nike. I don't know why uh, they texted me, but I didn't reply. And these semilunar shells, they have a length of almost two centimeter, to be very precise, 17.5 millimeter length. They have a um, width of eight millimeter and a thickness of approximately two millimeter. 
Good. And uh, yeah, just a quick repetition. So yeah, these are actually um, the criteria for ha block harvesting. But when you compare it now with the semilunar technique, we are, of course, just faster because it's just a tray fan. And all of you have uh, done this already. Though still you have to, uh, to go uh, to have to undergo a learning curve. So we are teaching this also in our uh, courses. So no hammering needed because, uh, yeah, so we, it's broken uh, only in the apical area. And maybe you have seen the small detail. In the end, I'm just bending it. I'm tilting it slightly towards the side, the trefine, and then it's even broken in this small apical area. That means you just need an elevator and uh, tweezers and can just take it out, but no hammering needed. So we have an intra-all uh, collected shell, uh, sorry, intracortical shell. That's why we also don't have a bleeding from the bone. So no block, but a plate. So we skip the block and we go right to the plate. That means it's a more uh, minimal invasive, no splitting needed anymore because it's already a shell. Uh, we have this right, uh, nice roundness. And I will share with you also now some cases um, how this can be beneficial. Of course, it's more minimal invasive and it's of course also more easy, but again, still you have to undergo a learning curve. That's why we're also teaching it then in our courses. So I think this is a nice way to go. And um, yeah, in my opinion, this might be exactly this minimal invasive approach, what we are need, what we need uh, to do the shell technique also for single tooth gaps, for example, when we are not um, addressing a big defect. So 44 year old uh, female patient. So um, I think this is a fantastic indication to do this technique because uh, what we actually want to reconstruct are these UG alveolaria. So I think there is no better possibility than using here these rounded shells, placing them um, yeah, accordingly and um, yeah, filling up the space then uh, with, the, with the chips. You see here the harvesting part, the approach is done exactly same as we are knowing it uh, from harvesting of corticosponges blocks. You see here this nice balcony, um, yeah, as uh, Professor Curry also likes to say, this is made for us. So please take advantage from um, this wonderful surplus of uh, bone in this area. And uh, yeah, usually it's uh, not the patient who is refusing it, but you, in, in, I, I would say in 100% of the case, if the, if the patient doesn't like it, uh, this idea of uh, using the patient's own bone, it's only um, yeah, the mindset of the, of the colleague. Because the patient, uh, yeah, the patient comes to you because the patient trusts you. Imagine you're going to a heart surgeon and you did, you need a, an operation there, and the heart surgeon is telling you, okay, we have maybe uh, option one or option two, and he's recommending you one option. Would you even think about disagreeing? Probably not. So it's same. So when a patient comes to me, I'm telling there are substitutes, but usually we are doing these cases with the patient's own bone. We take some bone here, it regrows, and the patient always follows because he feels I'm confident. And uh, yeah, why should uh, the, the, the patient question my recommendation? This only happens when the patient is not trusting you or if you subcommunicate that you don't feel confident. And this comes just by doing it. And uh, I can tell you one thing, if you did this uh, maybe two or three uh, times, not talking now about the new technique, but also with the blocks and you see the wonderful results, which really stand out to all the GBR results you have seen before, you will also gain that trust and there won't be a patient anymore who is not following your advice. And you see here also again in real time, uh, you see we have already collected one shell in the more, uh, more posterior area. Now we are going for another shell in the more mesial area. I mean, in the end, it depends on the um, anatomy of the external oblique line, how many shells you can take next to each other. Usually you can take uh, up to three shells from one side. And uh, you see also on the right picture, actually each marking is a uh, two millimeter. So you always know also how deep you are. And uh, yeah, in the end, it depends also on the, um, on the anatomy of the jaw. If it's more convex, it might end up that the shell is falling into the um, trephine. So in this case, uh, it was attached a little bit in the apical area. You see, I just bend the trephine a little bit to the side and then you can just take it out with a, just with the tweezers. And you see here, we have the, the nice um, yeah, uh, length and uh, width. And uh, another benefit is also, I mean, when we are harvesting a corticosponges block, usually you can't collect more shells there, only maybe at, at one edge or at one corner. Now we have actually the perfect form, this half moon form, to put the safe scraper in. So it's a, we can collect 
chips and you should you should also collect uh, chips from the um, from the shell but you can also collect it from the donor side which is usually not so easy um, when you're working with um with a block so we are filling that space with the chips we added here a palatal pedicle flap this is also one of our techniques we are teaching in our courses uh, it's wonderful technique for collecting um yeah more volume on the other side, it's also like a second protection layer for the underlying augmented bone. And uh, yeah, especially when you're placing your plate like vertically, at least I was reminded to someone and those who are in love with uh, with uh, fantasy movies or maybe you have kids, you might also know that guy. So maybe we could even call it a crew technique. Okay, enough jokes, back to the case. So you see here after only three to four months, wonderful result. Um, this is also, by the way, uh, the, the, the screws we are using. TMS stands for titanium mini screws, uh, soon available also to our students. And uh, yeah, they are uh, actually anodized. That means uh, they are not integrating because you have to make sure that after these three to four months, you can remove these screws. <clears throat> And uh, yeah, just second stage surgery and final result in the end. You see the surplus of uh, soft tissue, of course, this um, yeah, levels down in the next uh, half months. And you have yeah, a safe result here. So let's go in the next case. Uh, it's another vertical case and the uh, time is really running. We have already 45 minutes. And uh, yeah, so let's go into the next case, but um, I hope you're the same excited as I am. So a small vertical case, uh, nothing severe, but uh, again, I think a very nice uh, indication for using the semilunar technique. As you remember, uh, we are going now to um, this area and the retinal area, and we are collecting the bone from there. And you see here just the animation, how it might look like. You have to do a CBCT before. You have to measure the distance to the nerve because you need your safety distance. And uh, yeah, then you're taking your shells. And these shells can uh, should be thinned out. Again, uh, the shells are same important like uh, the chips in the end. Another thought process, because in my opinion, I mean, to use this strap with the protector is the logical consequence to the safe scraper. What do I mean with that? If you would look now at these uh, scrapings, which we are winning from the scraper, they are also like a half moon because we are using muscle force and it's also rounded. So when you uh, look at these shells, I mean, uh, they are also having this half moon form. But of course, for getting bigger shells, you have to use a drill. So you can't do this with muscle force anymore, unless you're maybe Hulk or Superman. So I think it's a logical consequence um, Yeah, after the safe scraper. So and you see here, um, yeah, after scraping, you really have this uh, nice rounded form. And uh, you will see now the chips partially collected from the shells, which are more white. Also make sure that your, um, your, your shells and your chips are always stored in saline. And uh, yeah, so um, again, you have seen this um, animation before. I mean, now I want to share just a hypothesis, just an idea. Of course, much more research has to be done. But I think when we are, instead of having these straight edge plates, as you have seen it before in the case, when we replace them now by these semi-lunar shells, which have this nice rounding, that we have a more safe closure, that we really have a nice adaption of the soft tissue on that. So my hypothesis is that the exposure rate with these rounded shells is even smaller than with the uh, uh, normal plates, you can say. But of course, I can't say it yet. It's um, yeah. So just a hypothesis and um, more research has to be done. And also, um, yeah, multi-center stu studies are planned. And uh, if you are joining maybe uh, yeah, our education, so we might even do some uh, research here together. And you see now our um, yeah, first rounded shell occlusally and uh, filling the space with the chips, always same concept, then filling um, the, um, yeah, or placing our shell on the buckle side. You see, so sorry when I'm so fascinated of that, but uh, if me, if I wouldn't be so uh, excited about that, me as the, uh, the, the inventor of that, who else would be? So, but I really like it. Um, yeah, how you see this, uh, this uh, light reflection even on that. When I shared these cases first time, nobody believed me that this is autogenous bone because it looks 
it looks kind of artificial, but now you know how we get it because yeah, they are actually collected with the tray file. So the nice thing is also all the, um, or most of the mistakes you can done, I told you before, cannot be done when also using uh, the semilunar technique. That means uh, because we cannot go deeper than two millimeter, we also have a less risk for the danger zone. So we cannot use wrong angles because um, yeah, this is uh, already, um, yeah, with the tray not possible. Crossing lines is not necessary. Too thick block is not necessary because we skip the block and we go right to the plate. Splitting is not needed. Uh, sharp edges can still be there. That means still you have to round off also if you find some edges, but of course you have seen the form, it's already much more rounded. So maybe 90% more rounded than a normal plate. And uh, yeah, when we go now back to um, yeah this case after three to four months, so you see here that um, the results are always nice. And uh, I'm sure you have seen already many of those cases with a, a shell technique, um, working with the split bomb technique, technique in uh, social media or from other speakers. I mean, in my opinion, there is no way around. Every one of you who wants to become an expert or who is already an expert needs a torsionless bone in your toolbox because otherwise you will never be able to handle more complicated cases. You see again these nice blood vessels. Uh, this is real bone. Of course, you have to give now, now function loading. If you leave it now uh, six or eight uh, months, you will also um, see resorption process. That means the function loading is uh, crucial. We can remove now the screws. Again, these are the titanium mini screws, uh, anodized. That's why they also look so golden. You see the quality of the bone not comparable to the bone powder um, yeah, or substitute powder, let's better to say uh, we, we are used when doing GBR technique. We collect all these chips, remember, think autogenous and uh, yeah, placing them the implants. Still, it's a vertical bone augmentation, place them uh, at least one and a half millimeter deep. Remember, after 10 years, we are facing some bone resorption, but it's uh, still compared to all other materials, very, very small. So remember, so on average, 0 0.75 millimeter, less than one millimeter. And uh, yeah, so second stage surgery done with the epicurial position flap, one of our eight techniques uh, from our education. It's a nice technique um, for shifting the keratinized mucosa to the buccal side. Everyone should also have this in uh, your toolbox. And final result, simple, yeah, straightforward case. Uh, prosthetically not uh, very challenging. And uh, one more case, one last case, let's say, um, because I think main indication might be when we have only a single tooth gap, which is in more than 50% of the cases, uh, the, the case. So, but uh, even when two molars are missing, it's in my opinion possible to do that. What you have to do then is uh, to place two shells next to each other. Of course, you need then more screws, but you see how we really place them on distance, fill the space again with the chips, always same protocol. Yeah, once you have to learn it, but if you're able to do that, um, yeah. So it's a very, very predictable way of uh, yeah bone augmentation. So we are waiting again, three and a half to four months, never wait longer than four months. And uh, I think if you would not see now the screws, you would not yeah, imagine that this is augmented bone, but it is. So it looks so natural, so physiological, so anatomical that um, yeah, I'm always uh, falling in love. And uh, yeah, the nice method is also here, we can collect with this uh, trifine actually also shells close to the um, to the recipient side. So we not, in, in the future, we also might not even go um, to another uh, donor side, but uh, with the Trefine, we can even stay in the recipient side. And uh, yeah, I think uh, the results look quite nice. We can remove now the screws again and uh, place our implants. And of course, I mean, some we have also here some vertical deficiency. We might have discussed if this is maybe a vertical case but um, yeah, I think in the posterior mandible, it's also fine to have a slightly longer um, uh, crown stem. So and we're coming to a conclusion and afterwards, uh, so stay with us. I have a yeah, special present uh, only for you. So avoid the following mistakes. No second donor site, uh, if not needed. So um, be aware about the danger zone. Remember that area in the distal apical area close to the ramus. So um, yeah, wrong angles, uh, always watch out that your plate is not becoming too small. So don't end up with a triangular shape plate. Um, crossing lines, that's crucial, even when you're working with piezo surgery. And uh, yeah, always uh, split 
your um, your plug. So always um, use uh, make use of these uh, plates. Also by doing th or the thinning out process, you have uh, then this nice amount of uh, bone chips. Remove all sharp edges. That's uh, very important that you don't end up with uh, exposure. So the plate position, remember vertical bone augmentation, watch out that this plate is a uh, parallel to the occlusal plate, a uh, plane, sorry. And uh, yeah, leave your big ego at home. So one step after the other, start with a baby block and uh, don't start with vertical augmentation right away. Don't worry, your time will come, but start small first and then you will see you have really an exponential growth. And in the end, also the plate stability is very important. So if you see in the end, the plate is maybe not 100% uh, stable, just add another screw. And um, yeah, the semilunar technique, uh, I just wanted to share it with you, might simplify the harvesting part in the future, but of course, more research has to be done to evaluate the new method. And uh, now I have a little present for you, but before that, I also have a small video for you. So I have to apologize myself. All of you who are not Star Wars fan might um, not like this video. I'm a big Star Wars fan and uh, I'm sure you see then in the video what I mean with that. So, but definitely it's entertaining. So enjoy, it just takes one minute. you like that and um, yeah so I didn't know if I see the chat and if I can uh, yeah, communicate with you or interact with you but um, yeah so usually I would ask then um, if you like to get more information also how to get access to the semilunar technique the tools and the TMS and our education and get more information about that then please uh, put number one into the chat but uh, I just assume that because usually <laughs> there are some ones uh, that uh, you will like that and afterwards we will also go then to the uh, Q&A session. So, um, so uh, I hope you allow me to give uh, just a quick uh, idea of our education uh, because education and equipment comes together. So because we want to make sure that um, yeah, the colleagues are trained properly in these techniques and uh, so you get access um, to these uh, technologies, those screws and all the other things um, only um, as a so-called masterclass students. That's uh, the program we are selling right now so it's the expert masterclass and uh, again it comes together then with the access to our equipment so it's exclusively available only to our masterclass students and uh, our education includes actually three parts it's the hands-on part um yeah you see first it's the theory part i also call it uh, netflix for bone augmentation and uh, finally also um yeah the mentoring part and uh, we will come into that, but uh, I promise you we'll do it uh, very uh, fast. So first of all, hands-on course. And um, yeah, this is held then uh, usually in Heidelberg, but meanwhile, we also have courses in USA and also now soon in Taiwan, so it's uh, growing. So the first day is uh, usually split bone block technique and the second day is a semilunar technique because we want to make sure that you know both methods and that you can uh, also then um, decide properly which technique is um, here um, yeah, important. So and you see, we have our course in Germany. We also have them now in Dallas and also in New York and in other, um, yeah. And the course is all hands-on. So it, it really is a nice, nice way of doing education. And I've been an educator myself for years, but this exactly. is a great, great way of doing it. Yeah. And then, so then I found out that, you know, this two-day course was here in Dallas, you know, put on by Megagen at this beautiful facility that is, also one of the best education probably the best educational facility in dallas area but if not nationally but it's great good and um yeah i told you about it's a hybrid education so part is a uh, hands-on because we have to work with it and um, yeah this is uh, of course uh, very important but i call it usually the heart of our education is our weekly life course for example just today we had 
four live calls where we are discussing the cases from our students. So they are sharing maybe X-rays or CPCTs or also clinical pictures. And we are going through your individual case because otherwise you might know it. You have been to a weekend course and maybe one month later, your first uh, yeah, patient comes up, but you don't know how to approach it. What should you take care of? Uh, how to look at the, where's the nerve? what approach you should choose. And here we are taking you on the hand and helping you exactly step by step what to do. And of course, if you document your cases, we can also tell you afterwards what should have been done better. And only by that, we saw that uh, yeah, all of our um, colleagues and the masterclass students were really able to master these things. Masterclass live calls. So, and here you will also meet the other masterclass students from all over the world top surgeons from all over the world and we will discuss cases and also your individual cases good and uh, yeah this is actually our program and uh, i hope you're a little bit excited or you liked what you see and uh, of course you can say now after this webinar yeah i had enough information but i can tell you one thing if you really want to master these techniques then you have to go deeper into that. It's not enough to see just a few tips and tricks. So you really have to dive into that. And uh, yeah, the program I created over the last, uh, yeah, you can say collected from over 12 years of experience with a hundreds uh, of courses and thousands of students I had already is really the masterpiece. And uh, yeah, this is our hybrid education. And those of you who are now interested in uh, getting more information, then just use your smartphone. This is the QR code. If uh, yeah, you rather want to use a normal link, you see here um, www.jointeambone.net slash info. Or if you are just now on your smartphone, maybe just uh, make a screenshot and then you can look uh, on this page later. I just leave it another three seconds. So on this uh, website, you can book actually then your call with our team and we will show you uh, in detail what is included in our masterclass program. And uh, this is the page you will see then. And uh, yeah, if you scroll down, you can just look for um, your date. Um, you will have a, then a small information call with our team. They will ask you some question. Uh, we will see also if it fits for you, if you have the need for that. And uh, yeah, just fill in your first name, last name, email address, phone number. And uh, also, how did you hear about us? Because uh, I decided also, especially for this cooperation now with uh, give you also something. Uh, yeah, I told you in the beginning, I want to give you a gift. So if you uh, make within the next 24 hours your appointment, you will save 6,000 euro in our program. So uh, the offer will be valid now for 24 hours. So if you book your appointment uh, now within these 24 hours, you will get this special offer and uh, save 6,000 euro. Rise of the Golden Age. Yeah, and I hope I can welcome many of you soon in our yeah, world of real bone builders. And uh, now we are coming to the Q&A sessions. Okay, perfect. Good. So um, if you have any, any further questions, also put them into the Q&A field or in the, um, yeah, I don't see it now how you see it. But if you have questions, there is obviously a window where you can put your question uh, in. So, and I see uh, the first colleague is more like a statement, no question, but I studies and for uh, Corey in Münster, he was a very good, uh, but strict teacher. I, I agree. <laughs> So um, the other question uh, was, wie viele Schrauben brauchen Sie pro bone craft? So uh, the translation is, um, how many screws do you need for one bone craft? So probably you mean one shell. Usually uh, two screws are enough for one shell. But uh, as I mentioned before, if you somehow feel that um, yeah, it's not 100% stable, then you should uh, add a third screw. But usually two screws are enough. Of course, you should have a good screw system. That means, uh, how do you know that it's a good screw system? Three criteria. One is you need uh, very small threads, very tiny or uh, mini threads, because only then you, you can ensure that uh, you have also the good stability within these thin plates. The second thing is, um, yeah, that uh, actually you should um, have a have a, a rounded head because if you have a flat head, you cannot place them in an oblique angle. And um, yeah, the last thing is that they should be parallel walled and not uh, tapered design because otherwise you cannot place. And you have seen now many cases where I placed my plates on distance. That's very important. And with the tapered design, you can only put them um, yeah with some force on the crest. But you should be. Uh, 
we are able to place them on this and this only possible with a parallel world true system. So uh, Maria is asking, um, can this bone technique be used in areas uh, previously compromised by uh, some oral pathology? Um, yeah, I mean, um, it depends now, of course, what oral patho pathology um, you have in mind. But uh, actually, we are using or we use this technique, especially when I was professor for Korea, in 80% of our cases in, in situations where, um, yeah, the situation was already compromised. 80% of these cases were actually treated with bone substitutes, with only osteoconductive uh, bone substitutes before, which failed. Sometimes the colleagues tried again and again with substitutes. Of course, it failed again because the regeneration potential is also then going down and you have also scar tissue the, the the preconditions are always getting worse and the only way to handle those situations to give a really high predictability is to work with the osteoinductive material which is uh, autogenous bone so um so uh, Allah is asking, uh, thank you, doctor, for the beautiful webinar. Do patients have uh, any discomfort in the donor side? First of all, very welcome and thanks for joining. Um, so in the donor side, usually not. Um, what they have is usually some swelling. But I mean, um, that's also something uh, I get this question actually quite often. And uh, the, 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 the explanation for that is actually also quite simple. I mean, I'm asking you now, when you are placing implants, does your patient have pain after you're placing implants? Usually not. Why? Because there is no sensitivity in the bone. That's why there is no pain afterwards. And now it doesn't make sense if you put anything or something like an implant into the bone or if you're taking some bone out. So still there is no sensitivity in the bone. That's the reason why the patient have no pain. What they have is usually swelling, and this depends usually uh, if you're injuring the periosteum more or less. So this is related then to the swelling. So we are explaining every patient um, that um, the swelling is uh, yeah, um, uh, similar, like uh, after removal of wisdom teeth. So and there was not one patient who uh, was not uh, okay with that. So this is what we can tell the patient, but usually no pain. And uh, then uh, Allah is also asking, how long does it take for the donor side to rebuild itself? That's a very good question, but uh, my answer will be a little bit longer because uh, what is important is because, I mean, why are you asking this? Probably because uh, uh, you are thinking, okay, if I go into that area, let's say after half, an year, half a year again, so is there still enough bone? But usually if you're doing a proper planning, there is no need to go into that area, let's say earlier than one year or even uh, later. What I mean with that, uh, in our, also, by the way, masterclass, when we are doing our plannings, we are usually looking then at the full case and we are planning always like the whole case. And it turns out that sometimes our colleagues are only focusing on one area because they want to do bone augmentation there. But what is important is that you look at all areas more in a holistic way at the all jaws, because it might turn out that uh, there is also another area where maybe in the next month you will need some bone augmentation. So it's better to have a, then a slightly bigger block. And this big bone block you can use for rebuilding um, both the um, yeah, both uh, recipient sites. So and um, when you have this kind of uh, planning and uh, you know, for example, OK, now you have handled all these situations and maybe another um, yeah, defect uh, comes up maybe after a while, then you still have the other side. So that means, again, you're winning some time. So usually to come really to the to the same side again is uh, yeah, usually not uh, happening. And uh, yeah, still to answer also your question, I mean, um, I mean, the precondition for uh, for regrowth in this area of uh, of uh, regeneration is very good because you know we have this uh, this balcony we have a surplus of bone we have too much bone why because we have also this muscle masita in that area so functional loading let's say so but what does it mean if uh, we take bone out from there and we don't have a good regeneration that regeneration in that area that means the regeneration potential in this patient was very bad. So despite the good precondition for good regrowth here, if we don't have good regeneration, that means the regeneration potential in this patient was very bad. And what does it mean for our bone augmentation? Exactly. The only good choice for rebuilding the bone here in this patient was autogenous bone, which is osteoinductive, because all other materials would not have worked in this situation. So maybe we might not have in this situation now the best regrowth. Maybe the external oblique line doesn't look so well anymore afterwards, but it was the only right choice for this patient. Hope this uh, answers your question. So um, 
So um, Marius is just saying, thank you, very useful, very welcome. Um, uh, Ala Khalil is uh, saying, when the similar technique is used, is uh, there any uh, need to split the plate? No, it's not. A uh, very good question. So that's the nice thing. We are actually uh, skipping the block, which is more invasive, and we go right to the shell. So no need for splitting because the thickness of it is just two millimeter. So that means still we should scrape it. So we should end up with a shell uh, if it's rounded or not rounded, it doesn't matter, uh, which has maybe a thickness of one millimeter only, also because we have to collect um, yeah, our, our um, uh, particles for doing uh, this kind of shell technique. So, but uh, to make a long story short, uh, no need of splitting it anymore. So Arben is asking, uh, is it always necessary uh, D, um, CBCT? Yes, of course it's uh, necessary because, uh, I mean, still we are talking when you are talking about um, yeah, the, 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 the trefine, it's a trefine. Trefine is uh, dangerous. So, and also when you're placing your your implants, you should have always um, your safety distance. So, um, we have a two millimeter thickness from the shell. We have uh, our metal from the trefine, which is approximately half a millimeter, and we should have another two millimeter safety distance then to the to the nerve. So, the minimum distance should be at least four and a half millimeter approximately. And um, we have the only security by doing a CBCT beforehand. So um, how much the cost of the main instrument um, when you're talking about um, this uh, trefine, it's uh, 350 euro. So congratulations on your presentation. I love the way you took uh, the bone craft. Sir Arthur is uh, saying that. Very welcome. Yeah. So um, what drives me is really to encourage all of you that you can do that. So, and um, yeah, the blocks, that's like the working horse. I mean, it's a, I think it's a nice to have. It's a nice gadget. It's a nice tool also with the strafer and the semilunar technique. But I really want to encourage all of you that you can do blocks because all of you, you're surgeons, uh, you're doing implants, uh, you're removing uh, wisdom teeth. So everyone can take a block from there, everyone. And this is uh, the mission I feel on. So Valeria is uh, saying, danke schön, uh, bitte schön. So, which means uh, thank you. Where we, can we get this device? Arturo is asking. So it's uh, only exclusively available um, to our masterclass students. So uh, you have to reach out to my team. Remember the link, the uh, QR code, and then you get uh, further information. So the instruments are also produced from my company. So it's not available from any other company. So, and we, as I said, we want to combine it um, with education to make sure that uh, the colleague is also properly trained to give best results to uh, his or her patient. So uh, Francesco is saying molto bella la tua. Uh, so sorry, but my uh, is probably what is it? Is it um, is it it Italian? Huh? So, but my Italian is uh, unfortunately. In, so besides pizza, pizza and pasta, uh, not not very sorry for that. So Valeria, very welcome. Uh, which CBCT do you for planning? Um, so um, um, what uh, you mean? What uh, CBCT we are? Um, Having it us, it's a Pax Duo. Uh, yeah. So, um, do the donor side need to be trimmed by the edges to avoid any irritation uh, to the soft tissue? Um, so, I did this in the past, but um, yeah, so since the last maybe eight or 10 years, I'm not doing it anymore. And I didn't have any complaints from the patient. So, it's uh, in my opinion not necessary. What you can do is uh, to put some collagen sponge in there. I mean, somehow it's also leveling, leveling that area, but uh, no need for um, for uh, rounding off these edges in the donor side. But very good question. So it means uh, you're already uh, deep in this topic. Uh, hope, hope to see you soon in our classes. So Maria is also saying, thanks. I love this class. And um, so um, then another question is for wie viele Patienten kannst du in Trepan bohren? So this is uh, meant then for uh, use. It's a, it's a trefine. It's a single use. It has an internal irrigation. It comes sterile, so it cannot be sterilized again. So it's for one patient then. And uh, yeah, these were the overall questions. And uh, yeah, what can I say? Thank you so far so much for um, your, um, your for your time. Uh, I really appreciate that. It's a because it's a very valuable. Uh, I wish you all the best. Um, hope to see many of you soon uh, online. Have a wonderful evening and uh, take care. Bye.